hi and welcome to this London Art Week talk on the National Gallery's current exhibition, After Impressionism, Inventing Modern Art, which runs until the 13th of August. My name is Emanuela Tarizzo, I'm an art historian and I'm a member of the board of London Art Week. Um, and with me today to talk us through the exhibition is art historian Julien Domer. Uh, Julien is guest associate curator at the National Gallery and with Marianne Stevens and Christopher Riopel has curated uh, the exhibition we're going to talk about. Um, he previously co-curated Drawn in Colour, Dega from the Burrell at the National Gallery, which some of you may have seen in 2017-18, and at the Dallas Museum of Art, where he was a citizen curator of European art and curator of works on paper, he curated Caravaggio, Martha and Mary Magdalene in 2019, and Franz Hals, Detecting a Decade in 2020. Um, his current project is working on an exhibition on Van Gogh for the bicentenary of the National Gallery in 2024. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Um, I thank also you, should Manuela. mention uh, for everybody, please write any questions in the Q&A box at any point during the talk and we'll look at them towards the end. We'll leave about 10 minutes um, to discuss any of your questions. Uh, so, as I said, thank you for joining us. And I wanted to start uh, perhaps unoriginally from the very beginning, so from the title of the exhibition, um, After Impressionism, because I think a lot, uh, maybe a lot of you in our audience are more familiar with the term post-impressionism. So Julien, if you could you know, explain, talk us through why you've chosen this title and um, why is it important in a sense to, to consider it after impressionism? Sure, absolutely, and, and hi, Manuela, and hello, everybody. Thank you for thank you for having me to talk about um, this exhibition after Impressionism: Inventing Modern Art, which has been uh, on at the National Gallery since the twenty fifth of March, um, which has been doing very well. I'm uh, happy to uh, happy to happy to report with a lot of a lot of enthusiasm uh, from the public and uh, very very good uh, numbers for us. So I do encourage all of you to come see it as well. It's running until the thirteenth. Uh, of August, but to um, to answer your question, and that's really the the, the fundamental question. Uh, it's a it's a very it's on the surface a very simple question for a, a very simple question and a very simple title of an exhibition for a very complex period of art history, and we called it after impressionism, uh, really sort of in 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 reaction, uh, in a way a reaction against the period the way the period has been thought about uh, throughout the 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, I mean, I'm sure you, most of you will be aware that, that the, the term post-impressionism is actually coined by Roger Fry in, in London, uh, in his show Manet and the Post-Impressionists. And it's, uh, it's a, so in a way an unhelpful term because it gives the impression uh, with, a, with an ism, uh, post-impressionism, that we are dealing with a coherent movement. And that's how uh, the period was, was sort of written about uh, by, for instance, um, uh, you know, uh, particularly uh, in the uh, in the middle of the, the 20th century. Um, so we're really trying to sort of undo this understanding uh, of it as a coherent movement, as also a particularly French movement, uh, and we try to take it uh, beyond that understanding, beyond the confines of France, and talk about it as a much uh, less homogenous, much more sort of pan-European uh, movement. And really it's almost, the title's almost in a sense a, a little bit of a joke because we know that Roger Fry was, was unhappy uh, with the term post-impressionism. And there's a sort of apocryphal quote where he's- Roger you know, Fry, sorry, just to sort of contextualize mm. maybe for the non-British non uh, listeners. Uh, so he was right, he, he curated these exhibitions in 1908, 1908, 1910, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, exactly, and a sort of great uh, art historian, uh, member of the Bloomsbury Group, um, sort of practicing artist as well, who was, you know, actually quite instrumental in, in the UK, particularly uh, in bringing um, what was going on in France and the most radical things that were going on in France to attention to the British public. But he, he, he uh, so this apocryphal quote is he, he's having an argument um, with a co-organizer for the show. Um, and they can't decide what to call it. They want to call it sort of symbolism, which would have been unbelievably confusing. Um, thankfully, they did not. And they say, well, let's just call it post-impressionism. After all, that is what happens after impressionism. And so we thought, let's turn this around its head and go back to a very, very simple thing, 
what happens after Impressionism, and we take that to be 1886, the eighth and final Impressionist show, uh, and then take it, we take it all the way uh, to 1914 and the start of the First World War, and really look at it as a pan-European phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And should we dive in? And here we have a slide of the, the first room. So we're going to also try really to, to guide you through as much as possible. I mean, it's a, it's a really fantastic exhibition with something like 97 works on show. So we can't show you all of them. Um, <laughs> but this is, we, we try to show you as many shots of, of room installations as possible. Um, so Julien, what's, what's in the first yes, room? Sir. Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we won't show you the 97, all the 97 works. You'll be happy to know that you'll have to come to, uh, to the National Gallery to do that. Um, it's, it's actually sort of uh, tangentially, I mean, when we, we, when we opened the show uh, in, in, in March, uh, Gabriele Finaldi, the director, making his opening remarks at the, the opening, uh, called us to our sort of astonishment that it was the largest exhibition the National Gallery had ever put together. Uh, and we're sort of very glad that we didn't know this, uh, particularly throughout the sort of mammoth hang uh, <laughs> that lasted for two, for two weeks. It really felt like a huge exhibition. Um, so yes, a very, very large, large show, uh, I mean, large for, for the National Gallery. Um, and the first room really starts, uh, we really wanted it to start with a bang, uh, for it to be really sort of impactful and really sort of um, announce what the show is going to be about. Um, and the fact that it is about non-naturalism, it is about radicality in art, in painting, and in sculpture. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very important point. And, and, and that's something that was particularly also very important for uh, Marianne Stevens, uh, the co-creator of the show, I mean, very much whose who's, who's idea this show was, and, and who um, was asked by the National Gallery to revisit the sort of landmark show she did, uh, the first exhibition she ever curated, which was at the, at the Royal Academy, um, in 1979, just called Post-Impressionism, Cross-Currents in European Art, um, but which he was sort of very, very struggling back to this show to realize that actually at that time it was a 350 work show, but she did not include any sculpture. Mm. And there was no sense, I think, in the late 70s, early 80s, or even in the 90s that, that, that in a way sculpture was relevant to that story. Or you would think of the period as being very, very siloed uh, between sort of flat two-dimensional art in paint and then sculpture. And so what we really try and do in the show is bring uh, paintings and sculpture together. If we had had much more space, we would have done works on paper as well, but that you have to sort of uh, impose yourself some, some you limitations. Have to make a selection, yeah. But and, we were and... very, very keen to, to be able to bring the, the, the three-dimensional surface alongside the canvases, because I think that there's a real sort of dialogue going there. And I think you can you can sort of see it here in the first room, um, you know, three artists, of course, uh, Puy Chavan, Cezanne, and Rodin, uh, each in their own way, uh, are their most radical. Um, and you know, and in a way, sort of, I'm sure some people will slightly jolt at uh, me saying radical and Puy Chavan in the same in the same sentence. Uh, and actually, it was, it's been quite quite funny because it's it's. Um, it's a picture whose, whose presence has been sort of questioned, I think, by, by, quite, by quite a lot of people, and even in some of the reviews of the exhibition. But for us, it was very, very key, because that is a work that um, Puvi uh, does in the 1880s. Uh, it's actually, this is the, the, the painting that, that uh, Emmanuel is circling with the cursor, the one on the left, um, a work, this is the reduced version on canvas, uh, which is at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, it's a reduced version of a much, much larger work that he does in the staircase of the of the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Lyon. I mean, if you, if you get a sense that the work would wrap around this the room uh, that we have the that, that you're seeing on the picture. And I mean, Pivi was a was an artist that the Impressionists themselves uh, would have thought was a complete bore. Uh, you know, he's a so classical subject matter, large scale public commissions. I mean, this is you know, can't be worse than that. For the impressionists but the exhibition is really is focusing on as i said on what happens after impressionism on what i like to call maybe slightly mischievously um the, the failure of impressionism which is the understanding that by the 1880s um the impressionists themselves even and and you know particularly i mean like an art critic like amy zola who's very sympathetic to what they're trying to do starts questioning the, the um, what they are doing and sort of says well you know is this maybe a bit superficial you know, will this, will this stand the test of time? I mean, we know today that it has, 
and you know National Gallery is very easy to walk across from this room to our main exhibition galleries where you can see you know impressionism and its full grandeur. But I think there was a real sort of crisis at that time, and I think and, and actually a real sort of crisis of representation, not only in painting or sculpture, but also in other artistic forms, in literature, in music. It, it's really sort of uh, one is reassessing what art is meant to be about and what representation is about and what the role of art is meant to be, right? So you're in that period where impressionism in a way is this last sort of step in, in innovation towards, uh, but in, in, in a form of an artistic form that remains very much uh, realistic. I mean, it's, you're with, within realism, you are trying to depict, you know, the effect of light on a landscape. Uh, the changing atmosphere, but it's very, very real. I mean, you are depicting what is in front of you, and your your work is being um, is being judged on its ability uh, to convey. In the case of the impressionist, your impression of what is happening in front of you. But it, it is an art based in in realism. Um, and what the what happens next, what the exhibition is looking at, is that what 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 what, what do you do when you've reached that endpoint? What do you do when you've started questioning? that sort of fundamental truth. And you think that this is probably not solid enough to hang on the walls of the great museums. I mean, that's what and Cezanne himself says. So to take you back to Privy de mm. and Cezanne, so you've chosen these two mm. pictures um, and then the two Rodins, which we're going to yeah. talk about in a minute. But what, so what is the, how, you know, why are they both so crucial to after Impressionism? Well, they're crucial in different ways. I mean, Puvi is crucial because he becomes, in a way, the sort of grandfather figure that that grounds this new uh, radicalism and this step into non-naturalism. So, as I said, the impressionists would, would have found him would have found him a bore. The this new generation actually sees in him somebody who is already giving a, giving an indication of where of where you could go, and he's someone who, for instance, is not afraid of working on a grand scale is not afraid of claiming like the public realm through these grand pictures, is not afraid of engaging uh, with sort of classical subject matter. And actually, if you look across the, the shot of this room, like it, it, all of these works in this room are deeply, deeply indebted to the classical tradition. I mean, which is something that Impressionism, you know, was, was sort of rejecting. It was about the modern world. It was about the everyday life. It had nothing to do um, with that. At least that was the idea, right? And PV really becomes a sort, yeah, as I said, a sort of grandfather figure, a model. And actually, when you look at this work closer, and I encourage you to do it if you uh, come to the show, I mean, you'll see that actually a lot of it is deeply unnaturalistic because he is looking at, um, you know, so some ancient uh, wall painting. The forms are simplified. There's much less of a sense of depth, a spatial recession. Everything is sort of on the surface. It's matte. There are these bold areas of almost sort of pure color. And this gives a lot, uh, uh, this gives artists uh, an indication of where they could take that into. And I think what is particularly interesting about that particular work by Puvi and why we wanted the Bois Sacré, the Sacred Grove, is that it is a work that if you look at uh, art, photographs of artist studios in 1900, and you know some of those radical artists all around Europe, uh, you will often find a reproduction of that painting pinned to the wall. And if you even look at the, you know, an inventor, or if you look at the, 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 the images that Gauguin takes with him to Tahiti, uh, that work features. So, and actually when you, when you'll see later, another work by Gauguin we have in the show, there are sort of visual affinities between them. So he is very, very important for that mm -hmm. new generation. So this is why he's there in the show. Um, so that and depth is that position. It's again about modes of representation um, of exploring sort of um, the structure really of, Oh. Absolutely. Well, Cezanne, I mean, you see in that picture, I mean, a, a very important picture that late, uh, late in Cezanne's career, the Great Bathers, which is, I mean, one of the jewels in the crown of the National Gallery's collection. Um, work, interestingly, that when even when it was acquired in the 1960s, was a hugely controversial acquisition. Amazingly, I mean, if you think of it, it's, just, it's slightly baffling. Um, people didn't get it. But it's it's um it's a really really key picture and it really shows Cezanne's concerns and Cezanne, uh, and I think why to me the juxtaposition with Puvi is particularly uh, convincing, is that this is showing Cezanne engaging with that age old tradition, of women, uh, depicting women bathing. I mean, it's one of the oldest 
subject in art history, right? It's it's deeply classical, runs all the way from antiquity all the way all the way through. Um, it's probably not a single artist that hasn't dealt with it in some way beforehand, right? Um, but he takes on the great subject matter uh, on a large scale, um, but he does it really in his own way, and he shows his own. Uh, and if you like the next slide, just just for, just to so people can see the picture better, really sort of shows you what he's interested in. And and Cezanne's step in his his journey into non naturalism is about uh, the fundamental shape, the fundamental structure, and and almost the sculptural quality in things and in the world. And you see, it's a work that denies any sense of spatial recession. I mean, it's incredibly flat. You have no real sense of perspective and depth, particularly if you look at the the, the bottom right of the composition. There's a figure, a very much smaller figure, but which appears like she's exactly at the same, at the same level as the, the bathing women sort of sat in front of her. And, and you see, in a way, he, he, he's not even interested in depicting faces or facial features. I mean, these are masked figures. I mean, they're almost they're faceless. Mm -hmm. They're sort of architectonic, they're geometric. Uh, and that was Cezanne, that is what Cezanne is, is, is is particularly interested in is going to the, the essence of form and of shape in a way sort of going for the, the, the this very sort of purity of the origins of things mm -hmm. uh, which you see displayed here in the, the Great Basel. And I wanted to show the last slide from this room with mm. the incredible Rodin um, statue of, of Balzac, the, the, the plaster for it. Um, if you want to say a few words about Rodin, and then we can move on. Yeah, then we can move on to the next. We can, we can, we can always, even in reality, always spend way too long in this room. Uh, but but you can <laughs> with good reason. It's a pretty spectacular thing. I mean, the so there are two the two Rodins. The 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 other one you've seen is the, the the walking man on the column again. I mean, very simply putting himself on top of the classical tradition, uh, putting a sculpture in movement on the top of a of a column, questioning in a way, what is sculpture, what can be sculpture, uh, how you look at sculpture. It's a very radical work from 1900. This is uh, the 1898 monument to Balzac. It is a, it's an extraordinary loan uh, from our friends at the Musée Rodin because this is the, 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 the original plaster. And, you know, as you know really very well, Emmanuel, and I'm sure a lot of you in, in, in our virtual audience does, I mean, when speaking of original with Rodin, it's always, it's, it's uh, you know, and particularly when you're talking about casts and um, multiple iterations of a single sculpture sort of existing um, is quite tricky, but we know that Rodin actually never will never cast his uh, his Balzac in his lifetime because it's a sculpture, it's a commission for a great monument in Paris. Uh, he submits this sculpture. It's an absolute outrage. People don't get it. The reject the, the commission is rejected. Um, most people saying, well, this is not fitting for the grandeur of the, the literary hero of the French 19th century. He's wearing a dressing gown. He's not even wearing the dressing gown. He's draping himself in the dressing gown. And when actually we know that that's how Balzac would actually work at night. Uh, I think it was profoundly uh, hurtful for, for Rodin. And I think also there was a certain amount of self-identification, I think, from one from one you know, genius one, so to, yeah, speak to another. One master to the other, but it's it's um extraordinary work because it's really it's a it's a it's a sort of a in part sort of an abstract shape. I mean it's a it's a hulk of plaster, and it's um what's incredible about this particular object in the exhibition. So it's the original plaster, the one that he submitted for the commission, that was you know, there's a cut in four pieces ready to be uh, cast, which never was in his lifetime. And comes in these four parts, and and took us the, the better part of the day to install each part, weighing about five hundred kilos. I mean, an unbelievably uh, exciting but stressful. All process. the more reason to go and see it. Um, yeah. I think we we can now, as you can see from this slide, actually, as you move into the next room, there is a wonderful painting by Maurice Din called Homage to Cézanne. And I wanted you to tell us a bit more about the second part of the title, actually, uh, inventing mm -hmm. modern art. Um, and what you know? What um, started this process, and also why was Paris? Obviously, we all know that Paris was key to this. But in what way? What mechanism? What you know? Uh, what patrons and obviously art dealers were behind it? Um, without looking into much detail, because we don't have too much time. But um, you know, and 
the, and the artists especially, and starting from this, almost to Cezanne. So why why Cezanne, um, which we looked at in the previous room, but. Well, Cezanne is one of the three figures that we refer to in the exhibition as the, the pivotal figures over the period. So there are three figures that we think cast the, the longest shadow over what is happening in the late 19th and then into the 20th century. And those are obviously Cezanne, Van Gogh and Gauguin. Uh, and we, which each have different responses to that, what that move in, into non-naturalism entails. And this work really, I mean, it's great when you do a show and you're saying this artist was really important to others and you actually have a painting by one of these, you know, artists of that new generation actually depicting all of them around one of his works and saying he is really important to us. So this is, this is a wonderful way of just making that point visually. Yeah. And i particularly keen of the, the fact that when you're in that first room, it is the only work in the next room that you see. I mean, you're almost looking into the future and to the impact it's going to have. And it's a um, it's fabulous learn from, from the Musée d'Orsay that our uh, friend, dear friend and colleague Christophe Deribaud um, sort of consented on giving us quite quite last minute. So immensely, immensely grateful. But it's a, it's a, it's a fabulous thing because it tells you it tells you just that part of the story. And, and there's even a, um, a a twist to it, which is that it's the the Cezanne still life that the, the Nabi, uh, this new generation of artists are standing around, was actually the Cezanne still life that belonged to Gauguin. It's the only work that Gauguin doesn't sell when he goes bust after having decided to become a professional painter after his successful career in, in banking. And it's a work that he keeps. And for all of these artists, they would have been the sort of work, I mean, the work that he would have put into their hands and said, look, this is modern painting. This is what it's about. Um, and this work too, as you said, Emmanuel, sort of introduces you to the context of it, of the period, which is one of great sort of artistic exchange between amongst artists. And it makes the point uh, of the importance of the art market uh, over the period. And that's something we sort of take for granted, but um, you have to remember too, that this is the, the, the moment really where the modern art market is sort of created and, and invented. And you know, it's no surprise that these all of these younger artists believe okay. of Ambroise Bola, who is the man holding holding on to the easel in the middle of the composition, his his sort of a mischievous cat uh, at his feet. But this shows you how important both the art dealer was to to of course promote the work, but then also to bringing artists together. Um, and this is a period of great inter internationalization of the art market. Again, something we really take for granted today, obviously. But, you know, it is really the first time that a picture can be painted in Paris in January, end up in a show uh, in Berlin a month later, uh, then spend some time in Spain and Belgium and then finish the year in, in the US. And so a work, a work of art can have a huge sort of impact uh, across, across the world. In a limited very period of time which certainly is something, as you said, incredibly new. Um, incredibly new. And of course, then also through reproduction. And, and, and of course, that's why we end the show in 1914, because obviously with the outset of the First World War, this great period of internalization sort of crumbles. Yeah. Um, and here we have some more of the Cezanne loans to the exhibition. Um, I don't know if you want to say a few words about any of them. We no, I mean they're just they're just extra. I mean just extraordinary things. Um, <laughs> I think it was really a question. I think when we when we set out to do this exhibition, we were we were very ambitious about what we, what we wanted to do. And I think particularly when you're only representing an artist like Cezanne, or indeed like many others in the show, you really want to you can only really show their their great works because you only have you know five five works per Cezanne um, and so everyone has, every single one of them has to do some great work I mean th this is well uh, an extraordinary painting amongst extraordinary works but this is the the, the his portrait of Ambroise Vola of course so the art dealer as, as you all know uh, Cezanne's dealer I mean the dealer that gives him his first one-man show in 1895 when Cezanne is actually pretty advanced in age and then we know obviously the idea that was to give Picasso his first uh, solo show in 1901 when he was 20 years old. So incredibly important man and a work that is, um, I think, deeply moving as it shows Cezanne's great debt of gratitude towards this man. It's a work that he, he apparently uh, took 120 sittings to complete. Um, very patient I mean, man. Very patient man. Uh, and you know he apparently, and you can see this in the reproduction. But you know the, the shirt, for instance, is incredible. And Cezanne would have said to Volard after about forty sittings, 
oh, I think I've just I've just about got the shirt right now. You know, so you can imagine like the hair pulling nature. But I think it, it's 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 also a good point to make about Cezanne as this really sort of labor. I mean, he's somebody who who labors over works. It's actually it doesn't come out easily necessarily. I mean, there's this 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 and it's a work that is almost three dimensional. There's so much paint on the canvas, and yet is super economical and gives such a sense of uh, intellectual presence. I think particularly. And you, you mentioned earlier that the uh, Still Life by Cezanne was owned by Gauguin. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we can probably look in more detail at Gauguin himself in the exhibition. Absolutely. That's the, thank you for this perfect segue into, uh, into Gauguin. Um, room. So Gauguin, as you can see here, is the, the artist that we see is the, the, the one of, I mean, the first uh, sort of painter sculpture artist that we have in the show, like this is really, I think, where the dialogue between painting and sculpture really comes comes to play, where you can really see Gauguin working out often ideas in sculpture before he gets to it in painting. And I think this is particularly true of the work, of the first work in our sequence of Gauguin's, uh, this one, The Vision of the Sermon, uh, which is, of course, you know, Cloisonism, the great sort of the, the, the work, the, the great sort of simplification of form that, of course, Gauguin arrives to first in his work in ceramic and in, in, in sort of and the ceramic glazing is here in the show. Absolutely. And you can, Absolutely. See, you, and you can, can see sort of a direct affinity between the way that Gauguin has to work in ceramic. And because they're being glazed, he has to uh, do very bold, I mean, do, out, do outlines and create these very bold patches of color, which two years later, the, so the ceramic is 1886, this is 1888, it trans, transfers to, to his painting technique. And then, you know, this is, this is an extraordinary loan from the National Gallery of Scotland. It's a work that really, really seldom leaves, the, leaves Edinburgh. Uh, and it's really his manifesto into non-naturalism. And when, you know, Cezanne was sort of telling us that it's it's all about, it's about structure and the inner uh, shape of things, the weight of things, uh, Gauguin here is sort of telling us that it's about the imagination. And, you know, he's doing it, doing it by showing us these young pious women that have just left a church in Brittany in pont aven where he'd moved moved for the summer over many, many years to get closer to what he, he deemed to be a sort of more primitive way of life. We'll get back on um, that. We'll be back on that. We'll be um, back. But he, he, he's here, so he shows you these young women, and they've just heard a sermon in the church, uh, a sermon about Jacob wrestling uh, with the angel, sort of obscure, uh, uh, an, an obscure topic, which is really about the crisis, I mean, crisis of faith and, mm -hmm. and the struggle. Uh, of faith, and and they've just heard this sermon from a priest who you can see on the right hand side, and who is sort of widely accepted that it that is most probably a, a self portrait uh, by by Gauguin. And so what Gauguin is telling you is that his work is like in that he's like the priest, and the priest has the power to conjure uh, a sort of mythical vision into people's minds uh, and give them sort of physical embodiment in front of their eyes. I mean, they can, the, the sermon is so good that they can, they can see it happen before their eyes. He embodies religion. And he's saying, well, my role as the artist is the same. And I'm, and I, that's what I do in, in paint. And I'm here to give, uh, embodiment to sort of myth and fantasy. Um, and you, you, and so that, that's what he does here in an incredibly sort of bold way of, with, with this vision sort of happening and this bold sort of field of red. Sort of bisected by a tree. It's an incredibly bold. Picture. Which is a bit of a forgive me, fil rouge with the other works uh, by Gauguin that you have in the exhibition. Really, this um, pigment, this incredible pigment. But also, I think here in these two, you see perhaps also his, his debt towards Puvis de Chavannes. What we were saying earlier about the flattening. Um, absolutely. Of the absolutely. And and. Uh, it's a sort of a wondrous thing, I think, this wall in, in the exhibition, the way that you see the very, very same red moving from one picture to the next. And I think really makes the point very neatly that, that this is not about reality, that this is really about color, you know, in many, many ways, that, that what Gauguin is really interested in in those works partially is color and is that, that red, uh, which can find itself in front of a church uh, on the tabletop and on the beach in Brittany, which looks nothing like you know, any sort of real beach or definitely not a beach in Brittany. 
And you see him in those two works in the same year as the vision of the sermon, like really transcending uh, two very traditional genres um, in the history of art, a, a landscape that a landscape that looks sort of nothing like a landscape that doesn't really have sense of scale. I mean, you have these two sort of little stick figures, but they seem completely out of whack with the, the stone, with the, the rocks. There's no horizon line. And then you have a, a, a still life that doesn't really look anything like a still life. Where unlike Cezanne, um, where objects have a real weight. I mean, here there's a weightless that's sort of floating uh, above this, this, this red uh, lacquer table. And the third artist, uh, Van Gogh, he, perhaps we could say he remains, um, here you see some of the, the, the installation with the, the Van Goghs, more um, anchored into representation, but, you know, with this incredible palette and vivid brush, brushwork. Um, this work, by the way, is, is one of my favorites in the exhibition and it's from a private collection. So I encourage everybody to go even just for the fantastic private loans that you can see. Yeah. No, it's a jewel, jewel of a painting. Um, it, it, the work that he does in Sainte Marie de la Mer, it's unbelievably, it's quite small, but it's, it's had such willpower. I mean, it's an, an incredible, an incredible thing. I think um, and it's a point to make about private collections. I mean, the, the exhibition is is 33% um, or a third of the loans in the show come from private collections. And because, you know, I think when we, it was funny when we first announced this show, uh, there was quite a bit of a backlash from sort of social media, people sort of saying, well, it's a yet another blockbuster and it's always the same artists. And, um, you know, how dull is this them again. <laughs> them again. Uh, and actually, I think what most people now can agree when they come see the show is that um, you are seeing these artists under a completely different guise. And actually, um, they are, of course, they are those very famous artists. Then we'll see in a bit. They're also artists that, that I think a lot of visitors have never heard about. I mean, and neither, and neither did actually we for some, for some of them. It was really a journey of discovery, even for the, the curators themselves. Um, but uh, even when you come to an artist like Van Gogh that you know, you know, that you know you think you know really well. I mean, in the section, the section where we have five works by Van Gogh, four out of the five are from are from private collections. Uh, and so there's a real sense of rediscovering an artist anew. And we were very, very keen to do that. And with those two, those two works, um, the previous the Mont Majour, the great sort of rediscovered uh, landscape about a sort of decade ago. Uh, you and what we wanted to show is that yes, as you said, his his step into non-naturalism is, is he's still rooting himself in reality, like in front of the motif, and that's why he has the huge disagreement with Gauguin, uh, with the the consequences that we that we know, we right? Know. Um, but you know, his he, he understands probably before anybody else that uh, there's a huge potential in the expressivity of paint, and like you can do so much in conveying emotion in paint. And what, we, what we're doing in this section of the show is really showing the range. So you have a work like this, Mont Majour, in 1888. It's in the outskirts of Arles in the south of France. It's a sort of lyrical, joyous application of the brush. I mean, it's a, to render this sort of this feeling of like a breeze, like breeze sort of coming through uh, this landscape. So completely sort of ly lyrical painting. And then when you contrast it with this work from September 1889, um, a work that was previously in the Bass, the Bass collection, you, it's a completely different approach to, to paint. It, it, it's, uh, you feel here somebody who, you know, has had a pretty tough time. This is, I mean, a work that he's painting coming, you know, coming out of a serious sort of relapse in the asylum in, in Saint-Rémy. One of the very, very first work he, he, he paints uh, after having stopped working for about six to eight weeks. And, and the brushwork is much more broken. I mean, it's a much more sort of rugged painting, uh, but a sort of astonishing composition uh, of, a, of a work. It's just a... And... In the foreground to, to the left, uh, which I think is the only purpose that it's... And it's sort of, it's a little bit, also a little bit nonsensical in a plowed field to all of a sudden have a bush in the middle of it. But it really gives him that red yeah. accent that I think brings the whole composition together. Uh, it's extraordinary. And here you can see the sort of ruggedness of the paint application, uh, which is extraordinary, and which was going to have such a, such a big impact on, on the future generations, I and mean, still, still to this day. And so we could maybe say that, so then this, 
initial, well, initial, very rich initial section um, mm. wraps up with these three artists. Um, and then, you know, one of the, the many feats that you've accomplished as curators was to also then, as you were saying earlier, explain that this is a, a European phenomenon. It's not just limited to Paris and it's also not just limited to certain isms, mm. to certain movements mm. of, of artists. Um, mm. And it actually spans artists from different generations with completely different concerns. Mm -hmm. How, I mean, I think we, we, we have here some of the works by Degas in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to talk about that um, and how they, he comes into the, the exhibition. Of course, I mean, Degas is a bit of a curveball uh, in, in this exhibition because, I mean, you, you could argue he's the old generation. He's, a, he's, a, he's an impressionist. Though, I mean, I think you could write a whole, I mean, many PhD dissertations probably on that. Was the gun is it, is discussed? It? You know, is he? <laughs> and that's something actually the, the current, so the Manet de Gat show at the Musée d'Orsay, which uh, will be in New York in the autumn, I think does really, really well in, in sort of questioning, questioning that. Um, but, you know, he's not that he's the old generation, nonetheless, but he, he's actually an artist that remains uh, incredibly influential on the young generation, uh, shares a lot of their uh, concerns. Um, I mean, like the work uh, on the left from the Nike, the Nike Ellsberg, Glyptotech in Copenhagen, a great example of, of, a, of a work that is in a way like pure sort of um, uh, exploration of space um, with a sort of freeze-like composition. It's completely non-naturalistic. It's a complete sort of invention. Uh, and then of course, I mean, one of my favorite works in the National Gallery exhibition, in the National Gallery's collection. I'm, I'm looking forward, I mean, I wonder what, what, when I'll do a show where I don't Both. include that picture. <laughs> it's basically mine now. Um, <laughs> but you know, this is a work uh, which is just a, basically an exploration of the color red. I mean, of course, we have an incredibly complex subject matter that we're not gonna go into now, but I think fundamentally like that, that's what it's about. And, I think what is particularly and why I particularly wanted to, to or what we particularly wanted to have the guy in the show is that he's an artist that is both a big influence on the young generation, but that is also influenced by the young generation. Mm. And you have to remember that Duga was an avid collector of the older masters like Ingres and Delacroix that he admired very much, but he is also collecting a young contemporary work by younger contemporary artists. And one of the artists that he buys a lot of works from is Gauguin. And, you know, Degas, for instance, is the first person to buy a Gauguin, uh, a Tahitian Gauguin, when Gauguin bought this show in 1893, coming back from Tahiti for the first time. And so here you have an artist who is seeing the young generation going into color, taking on color as their new, uh, as the new frontier, the new uh, mode of experimentation, using color in unprecedented sort of expressive ways. And this is a work where Degas is doing just that and sort of taking on that that baton and exploring that. And it's, I think also for our exhibition, it's it's a, a work that has a fascinating story that it was earmarked by the National Gallery as, a, as an acquisition from the Duga sale in 1918. We have the, the catalog with a little asterisk next to it saying this should be bought for the nation. And then someone, the, the catalog that the director uh, takes to Paris for the, for the, the auction. Uh, and then it's sort of struck off and in the margin it says, too unfinished for the National Gallery. Uh, and so the work is not purchased in 1918. And who ends up with it a couple of years later? It's Henri Matisse. And it becomes Matisse's de Garde. Yeah, it's sort of astonishing. After he's painted the Red Studio. But I think that tells you just how... Um... And you have Matisse towards the end of the exhibition exactly. as well. So exactly. there, there are plenty of yeah, connections that you really see. He's really this sort of rolling. instrument. And he's quite central artist. He's a painter's painter. He's an artist's artist. He's really, yes. really important. Um, uh, and then, yeah, and then the work enters the gallery's collection later. Yeah. Uh, I mean, very quickly, yeah, neo-impressionism uh, as well makes makes its appearance. This is a section, the second, uh, the third section, the third room in the show, looking at other manifestations in France, but some that don't really actually, uh, they're almost like the roads that lead to not to nowhere. But the opposite of what we space. just said for Dega. Exactly, um, exactly. It sort of closes down in a way. And of course, neo-impressionism, the 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 uh, well, the power, the, the the scientific approach, the dot, and then the 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 dot of primary color that very quickly transforms, as you can see on on the the, the picture on the middle uh, to the left, uh, this beautiful Seurat from Signac from 1900, uh, which is a sort of mosaic. It's a 
purely sort of decorative picture. It's not at all scientific in intent. Um, and then on the left, on the right, the works by uh, Gauguin's disciples, Anquetin and Emile Bernard, two incredibly radical works, but by two artists who burn out incredibly quickly. Uh, and who I think it's also, it's an interesting point to make about you know, radicalism and what's happening to art at that time is that because it's always about breaking new ground, doing something new, going whenever nowhere has gone before. And uh, some, some artists, give up they can't they can't i mean very humanly and understandably uh give up and so you end up with Rian Cotin, an artist barely known in the uk that's having a bit of a renaissance in the us uh, bought by many great american institutions uh but um you know he's an artist that that very he's a, he has a, an avant-garde period of about three four years and then he becomes a sort of neo rebendian artist for the rest of his life and the same goes for emile bernard uh on, on who's there on the, on the right hand side and Perhaps another one of the artist artists like um, Degas is Toulouse Lautrec. Um, yeah, astonishing, an astonishingly modern artist, but again, who has a very singular vision. I think very much rooted as well in what Degas was doing. This is a, a work that I adore, uh, lent very generously uh, to us from our, our friends at, at Agnews. Um, really, sort of, uh, you know, really delivered on this, and I'm very thankful to them. Um, you know, and it, it's it's the the, the portrait of uh, his friend uh, Toulouse Lautrec's friend Tristan Bernard uh, in a velodrome, and you can see sort of in in the background next to that sort of uh, red pole these two bikes going on at sort of great great speed. Um, if you look at it, it's an unbelievably daring compositionally. Uh, this sort of triangle of green. Uh, it's a it's a it's a sort of fascinating fascinating work painted in a very very Lautrecian very brushy sort of style. Yeah. And here you have Cerusier. Uh, so maybe if you want to say a couple of, of words, a few words. Yeah, I mean, this is the, this is the only work, because I realize that we, we are, as ever, taking way too much time talking about the earlier bits of the show. Uh, but here you, you uh, this is one of the great, great loans in the show as well, again, from the Musée d'Orsay. Uh, tiny work, but of huge importance, probably one of the smallest works in the show. I mean, it could, you know, it could fit in a briefcase. Um, don't don't try it, but it don't, could. Don't give anyone any ideas. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's it's the it's the work. It's again 1888, really important year, and this is the young uh, Paul Cerusier, who's about 24, uh, painting next to Gauguin in Brittany in the old term, and he's getting a painting lesson from Gauguin, and Gauguin is basically telling him, look, you know, what do you see? And he, Cerusier would have said, well, look, you know, I, I can see these these yellow these yellow trees in the old term. And he was like, well, use your boldest yellow. Don't worry about it looking like a tree. And the same goes for the, this sort of red light underneath the, the underneath the, this, this forest. So he was like, well, use the brightest red. Same for the blue shadows. Uh, and so he creates a work that becomes almost an abstraction uh, that is so modern, so daring. And, you know, you have to think this is, this is 1888. I mean, we're, we're still, you know, so quite a long way away. Uh, from from abstraction proper, so to speak. Absolutely, yeah. it's an unbelievably daring work. I think uh, probably some would say that the greatest painting Cerusier ever painted, um, which is the same for him, but great, great, great for us. But you know, it's an unbelievably daring thing, and it's called the Talisman because it's the work that he then takes back with him to Paris, shows to his friends the Nabi, uh, Maurice Denis, Edouard Vuillard, Pierre Bonnard. Uh, but and also represented in the exhibition, we're not showing yes. any because there's, uh, you'll there's have to come. You'll have to come see the show for that. But, exactly. uh, but but for them, it's the talisman. It becomes their talisman, the work that represents what modern painting should be about. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there's obviously, as we were saying earlier, the other side of this not being a, um, a single phenomenon that only happens in Paris and sort of only. Uh, revolves around a certain set of artists is mm. that it, as you explain in the exhibition, it involves different cities in Europe. And you've picked four, you and your co-curators have picked four, um, Barcelona and Brussels and Vienna and Berlin. Um, here in this slide, we have Barcelona with Picasso, but other artists as well, and Brussels. Yes, I mean, it was... I mean, there are many approaches about how you can tell the story in that period. We thought of singling out cities. Um, 
as quite a neat way to, to show places that by 1900 had developed their real avant-garde, um, where artists, of course, not only worked, but also exhibited as sort of collectives in the same way that the Impressionists had done in Paris. So really artists uh, taking their, um, uh, their future into their own hands, so to speak, sort of rejecting the official uh, salons. And so, yes, you have Brussels, uh, with, which were very interested in neo-pointism, in, in neo-impressionism and pointism. And then in, in, in Brussels, really showing the, the, the group of artists um, that Picasso was gravitating around as a young man before moving to Paris, before his big breakthrough show in 1901. And to really sort of challenge the accepted, or you know, one that's very much promoted by Picasso himself, of like the, the great genius sort of somewhat somehow appearing out of nowhere. Um, and actually, when you see those works in in the exhibition, you you, you get a sense that he, he's not coming out of nowhere. That there's great affinity uh, with what others were doing uh, were doing at that time. At that time, and it's also um, you mentioned, you know, art not just being rolling around the salons, but it's also not only around academic schools. So that's, I guess that's the other. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Of, of this. Um, uh, and this is the. Uh, that we, that we have in the show. Uh, and also, I mean, it is, you know, in the end of the day also shows you how remarkably, uh, I mean, how remarkable Picasso is as an artist that, you know, on this side, you have a Lautrecian sort of work that he does for his 1901 show for Ambroise Vollard. He never finishes it. And then a few months later, on the other side, on the same piece of canvas, he paints this, yeah. uh, this work, which is very much like a precursor of the blue period. Uh, incredible. But then you have Picasso and then you have on the on the right, a work by Raymond Casas, which were really, I mean, which we love uh, the, as the curators, which comes from the private members club of the Opera House in Barcelona. Uh, where Casas is commissioned in 1901 uh, to deck, he's commissioned to decorate. He decorates it with 12 canvases. He designs the, the fittings of the room as well. Um, and this is, we think, one of the very, very first representations of a car. And this is probably his own, his own car, uh, driven by a woman on her own. So incredibly sort of modern uh, and daring uh, subject matter of a woman sort of driving right at you with the, the headlights sort of, sort of yeah. blinding you almost. Incredibly modern work. So Even modern Spain in terms of first. subject matter as well, that's another aspect that- Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And it's pretty boldly painted as well. I mean, it's a great, great thing. Vienna. Um, Vienna, <laughs> yes. Well, Vienna, you know, of course, famously, um, the site of, of the secession uh, uh, has a secession, one of the, 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 the Secessionist sort of art uh, bodies for its own exhibition building, and here we encounter an incredible artist, Brancia Colapinel, on the on the left hand side. I think probably she's being shown in the UK for one of the very very first time. Like a really sort of exciting, um, I mean, not not not, not a discovery because it, it no. already exists, but 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 somebody who it's it's great to be able to bring to the public attention in in the UK. Um, I'm just a little tired of the rhetoric of saying we're discovering all these women artists. And you're like, well, no, they've existed, they've been exhibited, like, like, but we're just uh, able to hear, really show them and bring them into that context. And bring and, them into exactly this context of what we're talking about, of innovation and, and, and modernism. And, exactly. and then you have the two Klims, sort of, if I'm not mistaken, one before and one after he goes to Paris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, you have the... On the left, the, the Hermina Galia, uh, the National Gallery is Klimt, uh, the only Klimt in a, a public collection in the UK, a, a work that is so 1904, almost a bit Whistlerian in aspect, very Viennese, very sort of tightly composed, very sort of, um, uh, there's this sort of diaphanous dress that she's wearing that was created for the work, is this sort of like total sort of composition very muted, very decorative work. Uh, and then, yeah, then you got, then he goes to Paris in 1910. He, he, he sort of, ref he doesn't want to go apparently because he's, he's um, he doesn't want to be contaminated, so to speak, by French, you know, he wants to remain like a Viennese artist. But he fails. But he fails. And then you see with the, the Adele Blockbauer too, an extraordinary loan, by the way, from a private collection, the, the 
Adele Blog Barrel One, of course, is, is the, the painting better known as uh, the woman in gold uh, at the Nore Gallery in New York painting two works, this and the other one uh, famously sort of restituted in the early noughties. Uh, and this one uh, on loan, you know, on, on show in London, probably for the first time ever, and, and, and very, very seldom seen in public. But this really shows you um, Klimt having encountered Matisse and color and pattern. And it's, it's unbelievably brushy as well when you get close, close up to it. It's a completely different thing. Uh, that's an extraordinary work of art. And Berlin. And Berlin, I mean, this is only a little snapshot of Berlin. Of course, Munch, uh, who is Norwegian, obviously, of course, but exhibits in Berlin, uses Berlin as his, as his sort of platform and actually exhibits his first, his first show there is closed within two weeks by the Kaiser himself. Great badge of honor for an avant-garde artist trying to make a splash. I mean, that's really, that's how you do it, right? Um, and actually because of that, that the Berlin secession is created in response. So it's very, very key for what happens in Berlin. And this, you know, uh, his, his death bet from the museum in, in, in from Kude in, Ber in Bergen. I mean, one of his great, great, great paintings of the sort of mourning of, over his, his sister, him being haunted by this image of his sister, uh, dying when he was 14 years old and subject he revisits a work full of sort of anxiety and tension and um, desperation colors as well so yeah. vibrant and you know and you think this is this is his own way of doing the vision of the sermon by Gauguin I mean his own not saying that he's at all like take you know copying Gauguin but more this is his own journey into that that non-naturalist yeah. Uh, into language. that same non-naturalism and and in Berlin however you also have painters like Lovis Corinth who you know, upon first seeing it, this painting here, um, you think, you know, what, what's innovative about this? Um, and I know that that's part of the, the uh, not criticism, but commentary, if you will, that you've received. Why? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think you can, you can say, you can say criticism. You're being, you're being <laughs> way too, uh, you're being way too polite with me. Uh, no, no, but I, th I think the show, I mean, I think a lot of people don't get it. I mean, I think a lot of people uh, are, 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 are surprised to see works that on, on the surface look a little uh, conventional. Uh, I also think that that there's something in uh, particularly in Britain where they just, just don't love that sort of that, that German uh, that that type of German painting. but these are works that are unbelievably innovative. I mean they're painted unbelievably broadly and you look at this work, 1909, I mean my God is it's a 20th, 20th century nude. Mm. It's so bold. Uh, and then obviously, I think it was Jonathan Jones in The Guardian that made this this wonder, wonderful little quip and sort of saying we had in the same rooms a Lucian Freud retrospective uh, before after Impressionism went up and he said well, it looks like they've forgotten the work by Freud you know and I think it's true I mean that's when that that whole strand of modern I mean if Freud was born in Berlin like he would have that would have been part of his visual the visual culture that he was based in so but just another facet of radicality yeah uh, and then just this, the indication of where we, where the exhibition goes in the last, last bit of the exhibition, where we look at what happens after 1900, what does the new generation do uh, with what's just gone on? And of course, we first encounter, uh, we first encounter German Expressionism and, you know, schmidt Hotloop on the, on the left. And then on the right work, I just want to single out, um, uh, which, which might be particularly of interest to, to you know, people in, in, interested in London Art Week, that you know, this is a work that the National Gallery bought at auction uh, in November last year, uh, the very first German Peckstein. Expressionist work by Peckstein, exactly. The first German Expressionist work to enter uh, the National Gallery's collection. So it's a very interesting picture and also a great indication uh, of where we're taking uh, mm -hmm. the collection. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, the 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 exhibition and the collection more broadly, um, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And before we sort of come to to a close about where the exhibition ends, um, I also wanted to to stay on on your role as a curator, on your choices as a curator, um, and talk about Gauguin again briefly. Uh, we 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 have to keep it short, uh, even though it's not quite so simple. And his quest for what he called the primitive art. We mentioned it earlier. Um, the term primit primitive art is obviously problematic, um, but I think it's it's important to understand where what he meant by it and whether he actually came into contact with Polynesian art when he went to Tahiti 
Um, and, you know, what about the artists that were inspired by his work done in, in Polynesia, but were working in Paris? Yeah, I mean, fantastic question. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I've kept the <laughs> run down the clock for like, to have not a lot of time to answer the most, the most complicated of them all. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole essay I wrote in the written in the catalog um, yes. for those that are more interested in that topic. I mean, primitivism, of course, very problematic uh, term uh, today. Um, Gauguin, Gauguin probably encountered Polynesian art, though it's interesting that actually uh, he would have had better chance encountering it in Paris. Uh, at the ethnographic museum, uh, and not you know not not in the um, not in Tahiti, and where he goes and where he says, and I think that there's a certain amount of, of uh, mischief too there that he says you know well, I turned up and they, he says I, I turned up and it was all gone, uh, you know it had all been wiped out, and of course I mean we know the the French colonists and and missionaries had a sort of field day, um, though nonetheless that culture still exists today. Uh, despite these many, many attacks. And I think what Gauguin does where he's in Tahiti is actually he creates this the culture of his dreams and of his fantasies, uh, producing a work like this, which I think we also, we cannot show without sort of saying too that it's it's a, it's a deeply problematic picture because it is, it is you know, the 15, 15 year old girl uh, that he engaged in sexual relationships with. Yeah. Of course, deeply, deeply problematic. I mean, as a, as a, you know, as a white man in a colony, as a, co you know, really behaving like a colonist, and yet, you know, also we cannot escape the fact that this is an astonishing, great. This is a beautiful work of art and a very daring work of art. And so, you know, what do we do with that? And I think, you know, we have to exhibit these works, uh, not shy away from the difficult questions that they pose, present the context. Not in a, a you know in not an ahistorical way, but putting it in his historical context and yet condemned what what it is that he did because ultimately he was someone who was very aware that he was doing something reprehensible I think and also a last thing about this work is I think it's also very important to show them I think because it allows you to talk about the reality of colonialism and allows you to talk about what happened to Paura, uh, of course who who we know in history because she was represented by Gauguin but through her we're also able to talk about the countless other uh, young women and men uh, that suffered at the hands of colonization and whose story is completely lost uh, today. So I think it's, that's why these works are really, really key, both Absolutely. for the history of art, but the history of the world and, and the history of Western studies. I mean, the, the, the two go go together. I think one should never yeah. forget that. Um, and with and then we have, as I was saying, a, a, a slightly younger generation uh, who look at Gauguin, but they're in Paris. And then, yeah. they, and they go to the Trocadero, uh, to the ethnographic museum, and, and have a bit of a revelation. Completely, completely. Actually, sort of. Well, so the new generation, uh, Matisse and Dorin, particularly the two, the, the fourth. Uh, in 1905, they exhibit these unbelievably bold works. They're called the Four, the White Beasts, the Wild Beasts by the critics. And this is Dorin in 1906, one of his uh, great, great works. La Danse in a private collection. So do come see it in London because it's very seldom. Seen in public, absolutely. It's on everything that we've seen, I think, so far. But so the, the bold color, uh, owing that to Gauguin, sort of also an interest in the non-Western coming through Gauguin. You have to remember that in 1906 is the big retrospective of, of, of Gauguin's work in Paris. Um, but then Durand is also a deeply, deeply influenced by non-Western art and by particularly his, his very first encounters with it, which actually takes place in London, amazingly. So London has a, a part to play in that story. Too. At the British and Museum. At the British Museum. He's sent to London by Ambroise Vollard, yet again, uh, to paint views of London. He comes, you know, in the early months, he has a miserable time, uh, as we probably, a lot of us do when we're in London in January, February. And he goes to the museum and is astonished by what he sees and writes back to Matisse. And, you know, this, this is incredible. This changes everything. This redefines what art can and should be about. Um, and, you know, he buys his first work of African art uh, when he comes back to Paris, a mask from Gabon, uh, which almost makes its way immediately into the face uh, of the figure, uh, the figure to the left, wearing this mm -hmm. extraordinary cloak. This one. Uh, and so it's sort of lyrical, exactly this one. And so it's a sort of lyrical work um, 
and which is so key because it it it, it really tells you about the story of the, the non-Western sort of seeping into um, uh, European art and modernism. And At the time when really they place. were looking for different modes of representation, yeah, so it, it comes back into this um, narrative, I guess, of all the exhibition um, of you know absolutely how we move forward from naturalism and from the sort of more academic. Well, yeah, and reinventing uh, what 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 representation can be about, and and I think I say in the essay as well. I mean, not so much Durand, but even someone like Picasso is a little coy about the direct um, uh, debt that he owes to African art, and particularly about the Demoiselles d'Avignon. He's very very circumspect, which is work that is you know I mean, it's quite clearly indebted to it. And I think that's I think I'm quite I mean it's one of my 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 hobby horses or sort of sort of uh, uh, claims as a creator so so also sort of reassess and and, and uh, give its rightful place um uh, to these many many now anonymous unknown uh, african but the uh, artists uh that had a big big impact on representation in 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 the 20th century and on what art was to become in the 20th century and uh, here we have the Matisse uh, La Danse as well. So it's it's wonderful again in the exhibition you see the connection between painting and sculpture that Julien was talking about at the beginning, playing out in various parts of the exhibition. Um, yeah, and this is oh, yes. Yeah, you go you go for it. No, no, I was just going to say this is one moment in the show that I'm uh, particularly proud and excited about, and it's quite fun when you're working with someone like Matisse that you're able to do something for the first time. Because as far as we know, it's the first time that we're juxtaposing La Danse by Durand with this work by Matisse, La Danse, uh, his only sculpture in wood uh, from the Musée Matisse and Nice that he does a year later. And which I think of course speaks to his very, very close uh, relationship with Durand at that time. I think there's a great element of emulation between the two. But then you also see Matisse's debt to Gauguin who was also carving these cylinders in wood, and then also the debt to African art and the way that Matisse was was trying to, like a lot of West African sculpture and Oceania sculpture, like work directly into into a block of wood. And so it's a work that is at the intersection of of these so of so many many different paths that we're trying to uh, look at in the image. And so to to bring us to a close, I think there's one quote from the catalog um, in one of the essays by your colleague uh, Marion Stevens who writes that one of the characteristics of modernism after Impressionism is that excellent in art now lay in innovation. And Absolutely. I want to, to, you know, where does this imperative of innovation effectively take us, effectively take the artists? Absolutely. Well, I think it takes you to, to what I like to describe as the, the inevitable conclusion to what happens after Impressionism that if art, as you say, becomes about innovation, if it stops being about, I mean, and that stops way, I mean, at the beginning of the show, but if it stops being about representing the natural world or realism, if it becomes about, well, an artist's own voice, which you can see here expressed, for instance, by Picasso and his this great cubist portrait of Wilhelm Uda, uh, you know, that you can move very, very far away from naturalism, uh, but you, but it's you know something Picasso never gets to, and that that is abstraction, and that what I mean that that is the inevitable conclusion because if you're, you know, if art becomes you know about artist's will and the, the act of making art itself, um, if it's not, if it's about color, about line, about shape, uh, more than it's about subject matter, or more it can be about that rather than subject matter, uh, then one one path and one inevitable conclusion is that subject matter stops mattering altogether. Uh, and that Picasso doesn't quite get there. I mean, you see in, and, and, and actually I should say, he doesn't want to go there. He could have gone there. I mean, you see with his, this extraordinary portrait of Wilhelm Uda from a great, great, great American collection, uh, art dealer uh, and critic Wilhelm Uda, a portrait which is stripped out of color, uh, where it's constructed of these like, deeply, you know, almost like, like stereotypically cubist sort of um, shards, you get the idea, the impression that if you blink, they would have all moved and you would be left with an abstract composition, right? But they haven't moved, they're there. He looks like a recognizable person that you could you could see on the street with the incredible power of Picasso's work, that 
despite this, this great sense of simplification and abstraction, you still have the real person in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look on the left, on the right, this is, you know, Mondrian's uh, composition number 16, trees of 1912-13. And there, I mean, you know it's a tree because he calls it tree, but, but the tree's gone out altogether. Uh, and despite the fact there's a great sort of affinity between him and, and, and Picasso here, and that's this is how the, the exhibition finishes, a sort of funnel. Uh, the works are on two opposite walls and the exit is through, is through it. But this is what, this is the, the proposition that, that, that we make is that then this takes you into modernity and into 20th century art and to well, the art as we know it today, really. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, this is really the last, the, the Mondrian, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the last work in the exhibition. So we've tried to sort of take you from the first room to the very end. Um, we apologize for sort of running a bit out of time, but if, um, you know, maybe if there's any questions that you want to, I'm gonna stop sharing the presentation. So it's now just back to us. Um, but if you have any questions, about the exhibition, um, you know, anything. I, I have one question. Can you please talk a bit about Van Gogh's uh, plowman in the field? I mm -hmm. think we did talk about that um, ultimately, that incredibly mm -hmm. powerful, um, you know, wave of, of, of color, uh, one of the, the private loans from the exhibition. And then mm -hmm. we have another question. Um, to what extent does this narrative beginning, middle and end continue to influence the current art market. Um, I think perhaps, uh, you know, with the art market, if I, I have some experience uh, working in it, um, one thing is, you know, how works of art are presented. And another thing is um, dealers selling exhibitions, obviously. So I think that that, that, that narrative remains, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but the art market today, I'm just thinking, uh, some auction houses are starting to do um, say, auctions that mix periods completely. You know, the, there was that famous sale of the Da Vinci in a contemporary art auction. Um, so I think that you you can have both. But I, um, if there aren't any other questions from from the public, I thought perhaps um, we could talk. You know, we um, we've talked about. The fact that you know you have these these private loans um but originally this exhibition was meant to be um in conjunction with the pushkin museum in moscow um which obviously was not possible um given the current uh, situation in ukraine and um, so the the loans were um as as the director of the national gallery writes in the forward to to the catholic exhibition but and just wanted to hear how this affected um apart from obviously in, in terms of organization, uh, you know, substituting all these loans uh, rather at the fairly close to, to the opening date, uh, but also, you know, did it change narrative of the exhibition and what, if any other challenges did you encounter as uh, curators? Yeah, no, I, 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 the, the, the impact apart from, from me having aged sort of prematurely uh, and apart from this, you know, and and, and, uh, and uh, there, there, I mean, uh, there, there, there's funny aspect of you know the fact that it's a, it's a great sort of um, human tragedy on on just on just so so many fronts. Um, and I'm you know thinking about also you know well, of course what happened in Ukraine, um, which is a way greater proportion to anything that happened to us, or and and and, and indeed to you know what we think when we think of our. Uh, the wonderful colleagues that we were working with uh, in Russia, but it's um, it was. I think the saving the saving grace was that uh, this exhibition was conceived about five years ago, before uh, this partnership uh, with the Pushkin Museum came about. So, the, if you like, the spine of the exhibition and the argument fundamentally did not rely. On, on on sort of key works that were being lent to the show. There were loans, there were fabulous loans, but there were loans like like any like any other. And so when when this came on when this came on done and we had to rethink how we were gonna do this this show, it didn't have to change it, the, the exhibition's nature uh, fundamentally. It was just a question of uh, I mean having a year to find uh, some incredible pictures. Mm -hmm. Uh, which which we which we did and you know there's so many 
so many museums and private collections that came to the rescue. Uh, you know, like I can list. I mean, I've said a few. Uh, the Musée d'Orsay were incredible. I'm, I'm not going to do a list because I'll forget. I'll, I'll forget people and I'll, I'll, I'll beat myself up for it. But even like MoMA was so so generous, and mm -hmm. the colleagues across the board just understood just just what that that situation meant. But but thankfully, I think it's not a case where we had to reimagine what the exhibition was about. Like the the, the fundamental story uh, remained the same, just with. Um, I mean, and, and of course, you know, the, uh, these were the, the, the rightful uh, replacements for them. Mm -hmm. And there is one question that I think we can, it's very interesting, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, I wonder if you could say something about who was collecting these extremely modern works. Can we establish a taste or distaste for modernity in different social classes? And obviously remember that we're talking about four different cities with different histories and different social classes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, different types of bourgeoisie and of ruling classes. So that obviously is to be borne in mind as well. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it, it's wide, it varies incredibly widely, uh, but also it, you know, it changes very quickly. I mean, you have, I mean, the example of Van Gogh is sort of fantastic. You have a, an artist, you know, who's not collected in his lifetime, really. I mean, sells very, very few, very, very few pictures, only sells one picture at like a real price at an exhibition mm -hmm. uh, in Brussels. Uh, but then, you know, by, by 19, 19, 19, 1990s, in particularly in Germany, like is collected incredibly widely by, by incredibly wealthy collectors. And it, Comes a sort of household name, but taste changes uh, incredibly, incredibly quickly. Uh, but it's interesting that you have, I mean, in in in, Bar in Barcelona, for instance, a much more sort of bohemian uh, artistic circle. Even though you know you got someone like Raymond Casas who's designing works for the private members club of the opera, but then you have someone like uh, Isidre Nonel, uh, who is not collected almost at all. Uh, because he he is a I should I should say he's he's an artist who who depicts a lot of I mean his main subject matter really is um, these scenes of sort of extreme poverty and often of, of sort of depressed men and women maybe women uh, which also which have great affinity with what Picasso does in the blue in the blue period um, but they're not the work that you would want to buy in a bourgeois you know that you want to have in a in a nice sort of polite bourgeois home. In around 1900 in Barcelona, you know, you would have been confronted with a reality that you probably wanted to keep to the streets, right? If, at that time. Uh, and then you have cities like Vienna, where it's a very different situation with the bourgeoisie that very much um, then supports these artists. Oh, completely. With with the great, you know, the great collectors. Um, where I mean, and it's not only like painting, but it's all the entire interiors that are designed by Klimt. Uh, and his friends, but the two portraits we have in the show, they're two incredibly well-to-do uh, socialites. I mean, both incredibly important and powerful women are patrons uh, in Vienna uh, at that time. But that, that's a, yeah, yeah, that's a complete opposite to the way that someone like Nonel would have been collected. Yes. But it's interesting mm -hmm. too, if you look at Berlin, right? And you see Kathy Kolwitz, and there you have an artist who, you know, comes from, from a passionately a socialist family and is one herself um, and she's actually somebody who who at first her parents want her to study I mean want her to become an artist just sort of a, an amazing thing um, in the late 19th century for a woman okay. to be supported in that way um, but by her family to become an artist and you know they want her to become a history painter to challenge like the great male dominated uh, the, the type of work at the very top of the pyramid of genres but she declines to do that, and she wants to be uh, she wants to be to work on paper uh, early on in I mean drawings and printmaking, and then later in sculpture because she wants to produce artworks that I mean she she depicts people from the working classes, factory workers, and all the sort of the misery sort of associated with that at that time. It, I think you know early um, urbanization. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's a tough tough life out there. Uh, but she also wants to make artwork that can be seen and appreciated by people who don't have a lot of money. That's why she yeah. doesn't want to make painting. Uh, so, yeah. so it's 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 you know, 
It is incredibly diverse. I mean, I have here, I'm going to plug the catalogue, um, <laughs> and there are essays in the catalogue about each of the subjects that we've discussed and about each of the cities and how these differ. So I highly recommend um, buying the catalogue and obviously going to the exhibition, uh, which runs until the 13th of August. Um, thank you so much, Julien. Uh, that was an absolute marathon. <laughs> and yes, there it was. Grateful. Thank you, Angela. Um, and thank you very much for everybody for attending. Thank you very much, and uh, see you at the National Gathering. <laughs>